My name is Martez Reed, Director for Technical Marketing with Morpheus Data. In this session, we're going to walk through scaling automation in IAC via self-service. So one of the things the industry has continued to see adoption with, and even we've had conversations during these couple of sessions, is things like GitOps and how we consume automation within an IT organization. So traditionally, one of the things that we've seen, as in this example, of Lauren is going to consume some automation, whether that be ultimately infrastructure as code or just raw automation. In this case, she's using YAML, everyone's favorite data format. Um, so the challenges with it that I've seen time and time again is it's not particularly user friendly as it relates to getting started with it. One of the things we even talked about was how do I know, as an example, what environments are available? I see environment and it says dev, but which ones do I know are available? Can I change it to prod? Is it prod? Is it production? Is it Why not? staging? Is it STG? Is it QA? These are all the challenges that are experienced by those that are in the trenches. And so certainly it is uh, oftentimes an exhilarating thing to, to deal with that raw YAML or the raw HCL, or, and it makes you feel good when you actually accomplish it. Yes, but I spent the last 30 minutes trying to figure out what the appropriate format for that was. When we talk about business value, is that really the thing that's most valuable to the business? Or does that make us really feel good as an engineer, feel like we're gonna keep our jobs around for quite some time? I would argue that it's neither of those. There's a, a valuable skill set that we offer over and above spending 30 minutes or an hour digging through documentation, pouring through that, trying to understand how something should be passed, how something should be manipulated. And on the opposite side, one of the things that's come up more and more is this idea of click ops. So the challenge becomes the disparaging of the use of a UI. And so organizations are facing it more and more. Certainly we're seeing things like no code starting to become much more prominent. The reason for that is it's the ultimate goal of how do I enable users to accomplish what they need to accomplish it, accomplish as quickly and efficiently as possible. Sometimes that may be leveraging GitOps principles, but not necessarily GitOps itself in the sense of, I need to commit a YAML file in order to accomplish what I need. So as we start to work through this, Lauren has a Git repo. So Lauren is going to clone the Git repo down to her local laptop. She's going to update or create the YAML file, gonna commit that YAML file, and then push it up to the Git repo. In this case, Jane is going to log into Morpheus, enter in a few pieces of information, click order now, and away it goes. Neither is wrong. And I think that's the biggest thing that's important to come to an understanding of. If the ultimate goal is to accomplish something for the value of the business, the how is not necessarily always the most important thing. Certainly there are details that matter, but I think oftentimes as technologists, we often get hung up on, I want to do it the coolest way possible. Certainly, GitOps offers a number of capabilities, as well as CLIs and APIs to drive capabilities. But from a user experience standpoint, things like UIs, as well as oftentimes wizard-driven CLIs, offer a number of benefits to ensure that we're doing the right thing as quickly as possible. So of course, even in this particular slide, it goes back to the bit of the religious debate, Windows versus anything else of UI versus CLI. Certainly CLI has a place, but the UI also has a relevant place in ensuring that users get what it is that they need without, as, without all the hassle. So how do we accomplish that in Morpheus as an example? So if Lauren were to come into the Morpheus platform, as an example, I need to create a Terraform Cloud Workspace. She logs into Morpheus. There's a number of components that go into this process. So I'm gonna walk through the catalog item, but these are the underlying components. Often we get into the demo and we see, here's the nice catalog item, great. But how long did it actually take to make that catalog item? There's a number of steps that go into it and we'll walk through it. So in this example, we've got our Terraform 
Terraform Cloud Create Workspace Catalog Item. One of the benefits that I typically talk about this is that I can have any of you come into the Morpheus UI, enter in the few pieces of information, and accomplish the desired outcome. Which in this case is to create a Terraform Cloud Workspace. You don't know any of the credentials, you don't know any of the details about the environment, but you can fill out a few pieces of information. In this case, all you really need to fill out is a workspace name, as an example. What does this do for IT organizations? It avoids the challenge of automation scripts are created to accomplish something. The challenge that I've seen time and time again is how do I share that with someone else? So you walk into an organization and you're ready to start some work and you're a consultant. And you say, hey, I need X, Y, Z accomplished. What do you do? You go talk to one of the in-house people and say, hey, I need X, Y, Z accomplished. They'll say, okay, I can get to it or I can't really give you that level of access. And so oftentimes you're stuck waiting and waiting and waiting for whatever it is needs to be accomplished. So this goes on time and time again within IT organizations, whether it be bringing in consultants or in-house, is how do I share or scale automation across the broader organization? So in this case, I can specify, I want to create CFD demo 01. I can specify a number of Terraform versions as an example. And so the comparison between this and the YAML file is that I have a list of versions that I can easily identify and say, these are the versions that I can pick as part of this process. Pick the appropriate version, I can specify a number of different branches. I click order it now, and away it goes, starting to facilitate that process. Once again, neither is wrong, but when we start talking about and looking at efficiency, there's an opportunity to start to marry those two together to ensure that we're having the most optimal experience for our users. One of the things that's talked about time and time again is the skills gap. Everyone's not well averse, well, well adept to create YAML files or manipulate JSON documents or all these different things, but they do need an outcome. And so how can we drive that without many of the challenges that we see? Hmm. One of the things that's here uh, that jumps to me is uh, role-based access control, where you manage it. You know, I, I probably don't want to manage users in Terraform and here, but you likely have a brownfield implementation, you've got one that's there. How do you, and also how does auditing work? So if I launch something here, I create a workspace and I trigger a, a run, does it then take my ID from here and push it back to the Terraform log? So I, or does Terraform just say, you know, service A is doing the thing and then I got to go to Morpheus now and say, who, triggered the thing on Terraform. Yeah, so that's the, that's the beauty of this, is being able to leverage Morpheus's workflow and automation task capabilities to where I might include in that particular automation workflow, not only the creation of that Terraform workspace, but the adjacent components of my process. So it might be reach out to ServiceNow, create information in ServiceNow that says, this particular user went to create a workspace. Now we have the record from a tracking perspective. There may also be additional systems in the environment as part of that creation of the workspace that we also need to accommodate for to reach out to as part of that process. Now, if for this case, more do I, would I have to create, would Morpheus create a user in Terraform cloud, as an example, in order to do that thing, or will it simply pass my Morpheus data user param to Terraform to say, this is the idiot that just ran this, <laughs> this workflow. So the beauty of it is, in this case, it was a Python script that I'm leveraging. So the Morpheus platform includes various types of automation that can be added into the platform. So I could add another Python script that says, perform all that appropriate mapping as part of the exposing of that particular process. So yeah, so it's not necessary to create every person's ID in every single environment, you could manage potentially through ServiceNow that then would feed Morpheus, that then would feed the third party system as long as there's auditability across the chain. So yeah, not that I think that's one of the powerful parts of the platform and Larry even asked, right? How do you take what I need to do in Terraform, but I also need to do some things in Ansible and I've got some things in ServiceNow. So you could have Terraform Cloud plus Ansible Tower plus V-Realize Automation each kind of 
permutating their own angle into the conversation, or you know, we become that you know master control plane to to string it all together in a much more meaningful way with a lot less kind of overhead. That that is the ultimate end game. Question around the and, code piece. So in production, right? Just purely from a best practice and configuration drift perspective. I don't want to, let's say, for example, copy code into a task. Can I point to a Git repo instead of doing that? Beautiful. Yep. Kafka supports <laughs> the ability to reference a Git repository. Cool. Also specify the various branch or tag that I want to define. And so that's the, the power of the Morpheus platform, continuing to align with the standard processes, but expose it in an easy to consume fashion. You could basically be like OpenShift for the rest of your infrastructure, right? Like we, the idea that I'm going to push code, it will trigger an event. That event then lets Morpheus do the thing, but you don't have to be running on Kubernetes to do it. You can have that capability, mm -hmm. but on any infrastructure. Yeah, it's, a, it's an orchestration platform that can reach out to the various things in the, the IT environment to tie them together uh, or stitch them together to ensure that the outcome continues to be fulfilled, as well as abstract the complexity from the end consumer or end user. Question. The other analogy I've used over time to describe us is, is self-leveling cement, right? Brian, uh, so David's partner in crime, Brian, who uh, was our other co-founder, you know, when they started thinking about this in this way, you know, looked at tools like Cloud Foundry and others, which said, hey, life would be perfect if you throw away everything you've ever done and do it our way. Yeah. Like life, life is not like that, right? So we... We want to come in and take your, your scripts, your knowledge, your clouds, your tools, bring them into a framework that is much more sustainable and helps you kind of get value out of them. And, and Brad, I think you were hitting on the other thing. And Dave, I think what you were saying is coming. Is this where you were talking about where a workflow, I can stamp it out. I can basically craft it out in here. And then I can do an export. I can export yep. that and put it into a repo of some every, sort. Yeah, every object in. Okay. Yeah, obvious, you know, exportable, exactly. importable. And so either that's between your sandbox and your prod or those large SIs or OEMs who have multiple customers can take kind of take that body of work and re reuse it uh, efficiently. Regarding permissions, so let's say you have three teams, you know, you have a, the security team, the dev team, and the IT team, and they're all using different tools, different plugins, et cetera, right? Can I say, for example, like the DevOps team, like all they're doing, this is just a crazy example, but all they're doing is Kubernetes. So I just want them to have access to the Kubernetes plugins, integrations, and services, and that's it. Is that is that possible? Yeah, so the platform includes very granular robust asset control, all right. as well as the ability to support multi-tenancy, which is some of the things that we looked at in an earlier session. So it depends upon the level of granularity. I may decide they are part of a specific role within a single tenant. I'm going to give them that level of access, or I may decide I do need a greater level of segregation. Then they may be moved into a dedicated tenant. Got it. Thank you. All right, one last thing to touch on really quickly, dynamic automation targets within the Morpheus platform. So one of the things that was added in the release, recent release of the platform was the ability to be able to leverage metadata about workloads to use as you to use for targeted automation. So this allows us to be able to use things like a label to production or Linux or Windows, whatever you might associate with that particular workload for use cases like patch management, security automation, operational maintenance. Uh, to be able to run either an Ansible playbook, a PowerShell script, a Bash script, whatever automation against those particular workloads in an intelligent fashion. I will say that that dynamic targeted automation, one of the use cases we've seen coming up more and more. Um, you know, let's say you've got a development team, you know, doing their work in the data center and doing what they need to do, but then you need to provision those apps out at, let's say, two thousand edge retail locations. And then over time, day two, run, you know, jobs against all the database instances for patching or moving data around. So that kind of full life cycle from day zero to day two and beyond and the different users that touch that application over time. I think this dynamic uh, automation target feature is one we've seen even in just the month or so it's been around. We did a customer advisory board and they were super excited. Not that we're going to position ourselves as a patch management solution per se, but the, the use case expansion within that IDP platform framework is pretty powerful.
Hey, right. Brad, I know we have like zero seconds left, but <laughs> you obviously hit on something, right? Immutability, right? How are you guys, are you guys seeing customers that are saying, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to turn these things around every 30 days. I'm, I'm going to redeploy. I'm not going to patch my systems. And are you guys seeing that being handled really efficiently within Morpheus? I assume so. But I mean, are you, what are you seeing the adoption from that? Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah, I mean, the historical use, kind of DevOps use case and, you know, test and dev, those are, you know, those are churning a lot. It's an environment on demand. You're tearing it down. But then, you know, the the ones that do go into prod and sit around and you're using it more for day two. So there's a, you can probably imagine the pattern without Morpheus is similar with Morpheus, but just we're making it a lot easier to manage, if that makes okay. sense. It's not yeah, that we're, right. we're not changing the mix of ephemeral workloads versus prod workloads just because we're there. We're just making it a hell of a lot easier to actually go from point A to point B. Got All right. Ten second question with a one second answer. Do you have the ability to put in service and availability windows so that I could say only do certain things? This has to be available during this time and it cannot be up or down during these times. Hopefully, yes. So there, the, from a scale perspective, there are schedule thresholds where you can do some of that. Um, but there's probably more to that that would be coming in the future that's not there yet. Then.